Hello, Rotarians. Hey, I'm happy to be with you here today to make a presentation on the Rotary Peace Center Fellowships. I've had the pleasure of being attached to the district staff as the chair for the Peace Center Fellowships for about the past year and a half. I've learned a lot about the Peace Center Fellowships. I must uh, ad admit a lot of it I, uh, includes things that I didn't know before I took the job. Um, I think that oftentimes the Peace Center Fellowships aren't discussed much in the Rotary meetings. I've been a Rotarian for a long time, probably uh, longer than most of you. And uh, I had never heard it discussed in the meetings before, but occasionally I would see it mentioned in uh, places like the Rotarian magazine. Once I found out about it, I, I decided, hmm, there's, uh, there's something here that I think every Rotarian and every club might be able to, to put into action, but that's up to you. At any rate, there's an opportunity here for you if you want to accept it. The Peace Center Fellowships are one of the many programs sponsored by the Rotary Foundation. And as you know, Rotary has had six areas of focus that generally define um, the scope of what they, they want various foundation programs uh, to do with the money that they spend on it. And uh, I wanna go through those six. Actually, there's seven now because there's a brand new one. And I wanna mention one that I, I think everyone is pretty familiar with, and that's fighting disease. If I could see you right now and I ask you, what's an example of a Rotary Foundation program involving fighting disease? I know you would say polio plus good for you, and you, you'd get an A. Polio Plus is a fantastic program. Rotary Foundation and Rotarians in general have put a lot of effort into that, spent a lot of money on it to eradicate polio. Yeah, I know we're only about this close as the, the, the gentlemen and, and women in the, the advertising for the foundation indicate over the past couple of years, but we'll get there. Um, we know every time the, the number of new cases in polio goes down that we're winning and we will win. We, the year is coming when there will be zero new cases. So that's a great example of a Rotary Foundation program. The others, and I'm not, I'm not gonna go into detail on all of those, uh, but maternal and child health, basic education and literacy, water and sanitation, growing local economies, Hey, here's a brand new one that just made the list uh, several months ago, but I know we're going to hear a lot more about what we do with the environment. And so we get to building peace and resolving conflicts, which is where the fellowship program falls. The Rotary Foundation has a strategy that they adopted some time ago. The, fe the fellowships, by the way, has, has been a program in operation since 2002. So we got an 18 year history with this. And incidentally, another thing too, when, I, when we talk about these fellowships, don't confuse them please with uh, the other things that Rotary has done, such as the ambassadorial scholarships or the other scholarships that districts and, and clubs sometimes get involved with. This is a totally uh, different kind of scholarship. The, the strategy was, let's recruit a cadre of very capable people. I mean, very exceptional people who we will then send to universities to learn about peace building and conflict resolution. Why? Well, they're, what, once they uh, have been trained in this, they are not going to become employees of Rotary uh, battling uh, peace problems on the, the far flung continents of the world. They're going to be working for various countries and, and non governmental organizations and various uh, corporate opportunities and so forth that are involved with work building peace. Like I say, that's, that's uh, what we're doing. Again, to, to recap, we'll be very selective in finding the people we want for the programs. We'll send them to specific universities. I'll tell you about those in a moment. And then with that training, they'll be uh, very desirable hires for people in governments and NGOs and so forth who uh, can use them to build peace and to resolve conflicts. Here is what we're doing at the universities. There's the, the fellowships are divided into 
two uh, separate categories. The first category is those uh, applicants who want to get a master's degree, want to earn a master's degree in peace building and conflict resolution topics. There's a number of universities around the world that do handle uh, those particular topics. It's not uh, something that they, they just created uh, for Rotary. Um, the length of time that it takes to get that master's degree, depending upon the universities they go to, it's either going to be 17 months or up to a maximum of 24 months. Here's the first one I want to mention. There's no more than one in any one country, and the one in the United States is a collaborative uh, opportunity done by Duke and University of North Carolina. They are geographically very close together. Incidentally, some of you may recall that uh, the University of California, Berkeley, it was at one time a Rotary Peace Center. Uh, that changed some years ago, but uh, right now it's Duke and UNC. In England, there's the University of Bradford. If you're familiar with it, or if you're not, it's if you drew a straight line between London and Glasgow, it's about halfway up there in Yorkshire. Uh, it has one of the uh, oldest of all universities, uh, oldest peace program uh, that, that there are. Well, I'll try to talk some more about Bradford if I get the opportunity here. Another one is Uppsala in Univer University in Sweden, which incidentally is the oldest university we have in our group. They are getting close to celebrating their 600th birthday. Queensland University in Australia, and the International Christian University in Japan. Uh, I had not heard of the International Christian University prior to my taking this uh, uh, district role, but did some checking on it. It's a totally non-denominational university in Tokyo, Japan. To me, the significant thing was that university was created and erected in 1949 in Tokyo. Can you imagine what life was like in Tokyo, Japan in 1949 after uh, uh, four years of such a crushing, uh, terrible uh, war that they went through and, and uh, being so uh, terribly defeated with cities destroyed and so on, but to create a university uh, that is going to become uh, a, a important sponsor of peace building programs for the world. So these are the universities that you, a person can apply for, and they may not apply to go to a university if it's in the country in which they reside. The other opportunity, other than the master's degree, is what we call a professional peace studies certificate. This takes one year in total, and it works like this. Um, a candidate selected for that, an applicant who's approved and goes to one of these universities, They'll spend 10 weeks on site. Um, for most of that 10 weeks, they're going to be uh, getting uh, training from um, uh, some professors and uh, academy people who are very experienced in the whole business of peace building. Um, they're also going to get opportunities to uh, go on actual field sites. Uh, if you went to the Bradford, for example, uh, I know they send some of their students to places like the World Court in The Hague uh, are also down to uh, certain uh, areas in Africa that uh, have peace problems and, and conflict that needs to be resolved. So it's a one year program in total. So you spend 10 weeks on site, then you go back home. Now, when you were at the, the university, you presented a, a peace concept that you wanted to and act once you got back home. Now's your time when you get back home. You put it, you go about building on that. You're in very frequent contact with your professors and uh, others back at the university. At the end of your year, you come back to the university for one week and you present your plan, your, your piece concept, what, what it was all about, what you did to make it happen. And uh, watching you at that time, are the students who are arriving for the next year's Peace Studies Certificate Program. The universities are in Bangkok, Thailand, the Chua Longkorn University, another great university. Uh, it, it dates back to about 1880, 1890. It was uh, founded especially to be a university um, built and operating on Western university standards. And 
this is a brand new one. This is our first year to include Makarere University in Kampala, Uganda, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, didn't know much about it, but I was making a, a presentation of this to uh, one of the, the clubs uh, in Southern Marin earlier this year. Uh, darn if there wasn't someone uh, in the, the group there that day who was from Uganda, and he told me a lot about Makarere. He said it's highly respected. Its students uh, are not just African, they come from all over, and it, they have about 40,000 students there. So these are the schools that, are, that we work with. The Rotary Peace Fellows then, uh, once they, they have their master's degree or their peace certificate, then they're expected to go out and, and work to put what they've learned to action. Let's take a look at a map here. And uh, I'm going to uh, have to take a close look at my screen to uh, see this here because I know it's a little bit faint. But for what this is showing on this Mercator map is that, for example, down here in the area of southern Brazil and Paraguay, there are 42. Rotary Peace Fellows currently at work doing what they learn in our fellowships. Over in uh, the area of South Africa, Lesotho, Namibia, there are 12. Uh, over here near um, Mumbai, India, southern tip of India, 18. Um, 82 over here in the area of Chad, uh, Mali, uh, Nigeria. And um, by the way, in the United States, there are 193 at work somewhere in the United States. Many of them are working for non-governmental organizations. 36% of, of uh, when this um, survey was taken recently uh, are working for NGOs. NGOs such as Amnesty International, as an example, you, I know you've heard of them. Oxfam, uh, that's a, a UK um, based NGO, but it, it, it has dealt for many, many years with famine situations throughout the world. International Red Cross, and so on and so on. There, there are literally hundreds of those. So um, uh, more than a third of the, the graduates are currently working for NGOs. 15 are working for the agencies of various governments. 8% um, are teaching, 6% um, working at the United Nations. 3% are working in police and law enforcement. Um, I hope you remember reading, as I did uh, several years ago in the Rotarian magazine, about a police officer in Philadelphia who was a graduate of the Peace Certificate Program at Chula Longcorn. This officer, his last name is Pace. Um, he's, uh, uh, the, the article that was presented in the, the magazine talked about uh, the fact that when he got back to Philadelphia doing his work uh, on the streets and various uh, other aspects of, of his work as a policeman, he was much better able, he said, to, um, to be able to resolve conflicts, to um, uh, help people manage their anger, to um, uh, do what was required to end up with a peaceful situation. I asked him, because I, I telephoned him, incidentally. I telephoned the Philadelphia Police Department. I told him who I was and who I wanted to speak to. Uh, and sure enough, a couple of days later, he called me and we had a nice chat. I, I remember I, I, I said, uh, when I spoke to him, I said, uh, good morning, Lieutenant Pace. And he said, uh, well, good morning. Uh, uh, he said, however, I, I'd like to uh, correct you on something. I'm no longer Lieutenant Pace. Since I've been to the Rotary program, I've been promoted twice. I'm now Inspector Pace. Well, I think what he was trying to tell me was that the time that he had spent with Rotary away from his police force uh, was time that uh, his superiors in the Philadelphia police force thought was, was quite well spent. Uh, if you know policemen, or maybe some of you are policemen or have been uh, police, uh, you know, one of the the things that police uh, are, are often proud to say is that they've been to the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, it's taught there, it's, I believe it's a 10 week course and it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a really um, a high accomplishment in the, the career of a policeman. He's been to that course and he said it's wonderful too, but he said uh, it, 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 certainly what Rotary taught him does not take second place to it. He said, what Rotary is doing is, is really great. I couldn't help but think about this too. Uh, 
uh, in, in view of the many times that we've seen law enforcement mentioned in the papers recently. And when we get to talking about how you might find uh, people who ought to apply for a, a Rotary Fellowship, I hope you'll include some of the people that you might know who are involved with law enforcement. So these are where they work. Um, a few important details. If you want to apply for a fellowship, you cannot be an active Rotarian. You cannot be a close family member. So unfortunately, if you are thinking at this point in my talk, hmm, I bet my son or my granddaughter could apply for this. Uh, sorry, you can't. Uh, I've been asked why, and the best reason I can think of is, uh, for American Rotarians at least, is the Internal Revenue Service would probably very be very critical of you taking uh, uh, tax deductible donations to someone who ends up paying for a fellowship. Applications, with, if you know someone, whether they're here or elsewhere, they can submit their application through any Rotary district. It doesn't matter where they live. Um, Last year, for example, one of the applications that uh, we received was from a woman in the Dominican Republic. No problem. Uh, for whatever reason, she, she couldn't work with uh, the Rotar Rotarians down there. Uh, she came to my attention. I said, hey, we'll, we'll take care of it. And uh, so we were happy to do that. At, for the, the people who are considered for um, the, the fellowships, you know, um, when the, the team back in uh, Evanston gets together and they look at all the applications that come in uh, each, each May 31, that's the, the due date, um, they're looking for a lot of things. And one of the things they're looking for is at least three to five years of actual experience, um, you know, full-time experience, either paid or voluntary, in a, a position that involves keeping the peace or resolving conflicts. I think what they're trying to do is uh, to say that uh, they don't want someone who has never worked in the area of peace or conflict management to say, hmm, this sounds like a great fellowship. Uh, I think I'm going to apply for this. Uh, we, we don't want that. For one thing, once they, people have gone through the fellowship, they're not contractually obligated to Rotary to take what we've uh, helped them to learn and go to work for an NGO or government. Uh, somewhere. Uh, we want people who already have skin in the game before they apply. There's no specific age requirement. It's normally in the 35 to 55 age range. All classes, regardless of, of where they are located, are taught in English. We do recommend a second language fluency. RI will provide up to 130 fellowships annually. 130 fellowships. If we can find the right people, the people that meet our requirements, and incidentally, they also have to meet the requirements of uh, the standards of the university for, for which they want to go. If we can find the people, we are, we are prepared to award up to 130 fellowships. And this is really great. It's fully funded. It's endowed. I know in your clubs, uh, you've probably involved, been involved with some projects that involved um, foundation funds where you had to do some matching. It's not required here. Uh, and if a district or a club wants to make a contribution to the fellowship uh, funds, uh, that's wonderful. Your money uh, will be welcome, but uh, it's not a requirement in order to, to get the, the, the fellowship. So what does our funding cover? Um, essentially, all of the normal expenses that a person might involve might be required to have, including getting to there and back, uh, whether they're going to Bangkok or um, Bradford, England, or, or wherever. And I give credit for what I think is a bold decision here. You know, they're spending, uh, the foundation is spending about $4 million per year on this program. I know I gave this talk once and someone in the, my audience uh, remarked that, you know, considering the, what the foundation spends to do good each year, that's almost chump change. And I, I don't regard it as chump change. Uh, it's uh, any dollars that the foundation spent is very carefully uh, spent and, and, and they spend it wisely. Uh, but 
here's a here's where it it, it really uh, makes an impact. If you think that out of that four million dollars, if, if you divide it up amongst the the various people who receive fellowships, the amount of money spent on any one Peace Center fellow will probably be more than Rotary spends on any other single individual in that year. And consequently, it has to be wisely done. And it brings up the whole subject of, of peace metrics, which uh, it, that is a, a science that uh, goes beyond my pay grade to do, but I, I know that the people back in the foundation are working on this. Um, you know, with uh, the, the Polio Plus, it, it was an easy thing to, to check the number of new polio cases each year, and it tells you whether or not the, the money you spent on Polio Plus that year was working or not. How do you do that with, with a, a peace program like this? Uh, um, it can be done, and uh, uh, it is being done. I'm confident that the money is being well spent. So here are some important dates. And this is for the 2022 to 23 school year. We start at, we have to work about a year in advance on all of this. So in essence, th this is for applications that would be due um, next May 31 and starting in um, the summer of the year after that. So applications will become available. We, we can't even look at them uh, until April 1. What I'm asking you to do, if you know people in your club, people in your fam uh, not family, uh, people uh, in, in your neighborhood, uh, anyone who is a, a good applicant for this, let me know by April 1, at, at least, uh, about this. Call me and, and talk to me about it. First of all, uh, I'll be glad to talk to that person, wherever they are in their decision process to try to help them understand what the fellowship program is. Um, and also that when the applications are due, they do May 31, and these are not applications that you can sit down at 11 o'clock the night before and, and fill it out and get it post stamped someplace. Uh, the applications that I saw this past year were running in the 25 to 50 page range for each. Uh, once those applications um, are sent in to Rotary on May 31, then those um, who uh, wish to have our district endorse them, we will conduct interviews with those applicants in early June. And whether or not uh, you or your club submitted applications, if you have an interest in uh, helping with the interviews, let me know. Uh, I'll be glad to see what we can work out. Let's see, make it go, there we go. Okay, so what do you do next? Okay, you got your paper and pencil out, you're ready to write. This is really important. Here's the very first thing I want you to do. Yeah, be proud. How many organizations do you belong to that are currently trying to help the world with a program like this? I don't know of any others. So uh, stick your chest out, be proud. Let your friends and neighbors know about this great program. Um, let your, uh, your new members in your club. I know you, you have some sort of way of, of bringing your new members up to date on what Rotary is. Uh, give them information about the Rotary Peace Fellowships. Um, someone out there watching and listening today is involved with new membership, with recruiting new members for your club. Uh, whatever list of fantastic features and selling points you have for joining your club, add the fellowship program to it too. Teach your club's members about their peace centers. Look for applicants, they're everywhere. Uh, let me give you an example of this. One of the applicants that I'm really high on uh, that applied this past year is a teacher from, from a Bay Area school. He's a very special teacher. He teaches incarcerated kids in a juvenile detention center. He's really dedicated to trying to help these people. He's told me how hard it is uh, to, uh, to, to make progress with these kids. He went on his own dime about um, two or three years ago to an international peace conference in India. While he was there at a break time when there was a chance to grab a cup of coffee or tea or whatever they were drinking there, he was uh, chatting with another uh, person, a gentleman from Australia, who turned out to be a Rotarian from Australia, uh, listening to 
uh, this applicant talk, he said to him, why don't you apply for a Rotary Peace Center Fellowship? Hey, that's all it took, you know, <laughs> and I'm confident he, this, this gentleman is going to be picked and uh, I'm going to be able to uh, announce his name and, and tell you more about him. But um, I look for people uh, wherever I go. If you look for people wherever you go, we're spreading the area that, that we uh, have in order to find great applicants. That's what I'm asking you to do. Here's something you might do. <clears throat> appoint a Peace Center for your chair. It may be the, the first time your club has had one. <clears throat> and if you do appoint a Peace Center chair, <clears throat> let me know who he or she is and I'll, I'll do my best to work with them and keep them up to date. And schedule a Rotary Peace Center speaking for a club meeting once we're past this COVID business. At the moment, that would be me and it would be a talk somewhere along the lines of, of what you uh, just sat through here with me. Finally, we started out talking really about Polio Plus. And so uh, with that uh, in mind, some of you may recognize the picture of this gentleman. He's uh, someone I've known for 25 or 30 years. He's past district governor and past president of the Rotary Club of Novato, Russ Ketron. He's also been a, a major worker in our district in uh, promoting the Polio Plus program. If you know him well, you may know that as a child, he was afflicted with polio. He's got skin in the game. He knows what it's like. And so he puts so much effort into it. At um, a meeting, a, a district staff meeting in October of 2018, I was just newly arrived <clears throat> and I was asked to stand up and just give a brief talk about what I thought I was gonna do during the year. And when I was done, Russ raised his hand, stood up, and here's what he said. The day will come when Rotary will have successfully completed its Polio Plus mission. And then a signature goal of Rotarians will be peace. Thank you, Russ. Thank you all for, for listening. Um, if you know someone who should apply, you want a speaker for your club, give me a call. Here's my name, here's my email, here's my phone number. I'm glad to be a Rotarian and uh, glad to be a Rotarian in this great district with you. Thank you very much.